expert panel members come on their own dime. Uh, they don't get comp, they pay just like the same as you do. And one little perk that uh, I normally allow them is to uh, tell us what's exciting, what's going on in, in their neck of the woods or in what they're doing. So we're going to go down to the table and Christine, uh, anything exciting going on in Morningstar that uh, you'd like to tell the crowd about or do you have any books in the works? No books for me. Um, I would say one concept that I've been excited about, the more I've talked to Morningstar.com users about it, is this idea of bucketed portfolios in retirement. I've done a couple model portfolios recently, and the concept is that you set aside liquid assets to fund near-term cash needs, intermediate-term assets to fund intermediate-term needs, and then we have the rest of the portfolio stocks. And for a lot of people, the end portfolio ends up looking a lot like what they would have had in the first place if they were just using a balanced approach. But the bucketing concept, I think, helps people visualize what an in-retirement portfolio should look like. So I think it's helpful from that standpoint. So I've been working on that, um, interviewing a lot of great people at Vanguard yesterday and a lot of great people from this conference yesterday morning. So those videos will roll out on our website over the next month or so. You should keep your eyes peeled for that. And then um, personally, I'm going on a six week sabbatical starting next week. And so I'm excited about that, going to spend some time in Argentina and, um, and spend some time with, with family and projects and so forth. So it's a nice perk that we have at Morningstar and I'll be taking advantage of it soon. And Bill, I know you uh, uh, ventured into a new field, electronic publishing. Yeah, you know, with some help from Mike, but what, what I'm really doing is uh, traveling uh, to Burma this winter and expecting my first grandchild, and sure, I'm doing some writing, I'm always doing some writing. But uh, I've got a new booklet coming out on alternatives, but if you listen carefully, especially if you listen to the interview, it'll be coming out on the Morningstar site, you don't need to buy it. <laughs> Four foot putts. Yeah, four foot putts. Um, 
You know, I'm kind of doing more of the same. I do have the second uh, uh, coffee house book in the works, so I've been saying that for the last two or three years. Where's Bill Falloon? Bill Falloon, would you stand up, please? I guess he's not here, but uh, he's been a big uh, advocate of the global heads out uh, of John uh, Wiley. And, uh, but, but basically what I'm doing is, is continuing to spend a lot of time at uh, Soundmark, putting in uh, uh, systems and structures to continue to uh, accentuate, uh, you know, the Boglehead philosophy with the folks we connect with. Uh, uh, you know, I really, Alan, I respect your getting under the skin of the financial industry because it need, they need to have someone, you know, kind of prodding them. Uh, and, um, you know, the, again, the need is just phenomenal. And, and uh, as I said before, I would encourage all of you to continue to uh, to share the philosophy with others. So a lot of people ask, uh, well, gosh, you know, how do I best uh, articulate or share it? Why doesn't a person embrace it like I do? And what I have found is that people need to hear the philosophy about 20 or 30 times before they get it. That's been my experience. You know, did has anybody uh, read the Boglehead side about what happened on Jeopardy a couple weeks ago? Yeah. What happened? Um, they couldn't Stand up and sit, tell us what happened. Well, they, they couldn't. They gave them the answer. And they, oh, Who gave them the answer? The, the, the Warren, Warren, Warren Buffett. Warren, yeah, the, the Warren Buffett gave the answer and they couldn't come up with the index fund to say any proper response. I don't remember what, what the answer was, so you got to the question. The question was, what is an index fund? Oh, okay. Yeah, the answer is, what is a low-cost investment that mimics an S&P 500, blah, 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 or something? Isn't that what the yeah, answer they was? They spelled it out pretty clearly. They spelled it out clearly, and not one person could answer index funds. And to us, index funds is just like second nature, but to the average intelligent investor, it's like, they don't know what an index fund is. So you have to continue to articulate it time and time again, keep it simple. You know, again, luckily, you can have a profoundly positive impact on people's lives. So Mel said that because you wound up this part with me, I get to ask a question. So the question for the panelists is, when you're working with folks, how do you define risk? When you're working with clients, you know, this whole thing of risk and standard deviation and blah, blah, blah. I define it as how do you articulate risk to a human goals. being? What? Not reaching your financial goals. Bill, Mike, Christine? I tend to talk about it differently, whether I'm talking with somebody who's in the accumulation stage or the distribution stage. In the accumulation stage, I'm mostly talking about just uncertainty of returns, volatility, uh, probability of the portfolio is going to go down by X amount, things of that nature. In the distribution stage, we're talking about um, percentage of spending goals that go unmet, for instance. Uh, sometimes that's expressed as probability of running out of money. Sometimes it's uh, probability of running out of money doesn't cover it, because sometimes it's different if you run out of money in the fifth year of retirement as opposed to the 25th year of retirement. So there are other metrics, but it depends who I'm talking to. Yeah, we, we deal with that problem by not accepting clients who don't understand what a standard deviation is. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he has three clients and they all have 75. <laughs> I like uh, Rick and Mike's definition, and I do think that risk tolerance has been given way too much play in terms of investors' financial decision making. In a lot of ways, I feel like it's saying, okay, if you're going to give your emotions free reign, to um, help determine this financial plan, and I think that's a terrible idea. So I like I like risk uh, framed in the realm of risk capacity. How much with, how much risk can you actually withstand without altering the goals that you had set out for yourself? Well, I always try to uh, instead of working in percentages, I, I try to work in dollars because I think people understand dollars a lot more than percentages. So. If someone has a half a million dollar portfolio and they're going to go 50-50, uh, they got 250 in equities, and I ask if they can stand to lose 125,000. Not, can you afford to lose 50 percent? And then when you put it in dollars, people go, Oh my God, no! <laughs> that's that's what they really need to do to get to their own comfort level, which is when they get to that sleep night, and that's the proper asset allocation for them. 
Well, my answer is a compilation of everyone. I really like what Mel said. So if somebody's got a million dollar portfolio, they've got 50% in bonds and 50% in stocks. You know, we look them in the eye and say, hey, your 50%, your half a million dollar portfolio is going to drop, you know, 25 to 40%. And that is what, how much? I can't do the math. Five, you know, it's going to a quarter of a million dollars, maybe. Two. So we say your portfolio will drop $200,000 in the next four years. How do you feel about that? And they, you know, it puts it in terms that they can understand. And, and But what's more important, I love Charles Ellis' description of risk. In his book, what's his book? Winning the Losers Game or something like that? He says, risk is the chance that you will not have the money to pay a bill when it comes due. I, I just love that. You know, you can talk about risk in standard deviation, but I love Charles Ellis' definition of risk. And if you can show people that, yeah, interest rates are at 1%, you're not getting anything on your fixed income investments, but if you can show them that even in a decline of 20 to 40 percent, they're still going to be able to pay their bills for the next 10 years. They think, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter what the stock market does over the next two years. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the concept that I try to continually get across when I talk to any, any kind of audience uh, from, from, you know, from retail investors all the way up to people at the university level is to tell them you know, that the real definition of risk is not standard deviation or volatility. And I, I, I make a point by showing two slides. One is the typical sort of you know, thing you pick off the internet from crybaby traders. You know, the, 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 you've all seen the pictures of the guys in, in suits standing next to monitors looking like they've just had their gonads squeezed. And, 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 and then that's not risk, all right? Because those guys will still be wearing $2,000 suits. The next day, they will still be dining at the Russian tea house the next day. The real, the, what the, the, then the next slide that I show is a picture of a guy pushing uh, a shopping cart under an underpass in the rain. I say, that's risk. Yeah. I tend to think about it in, in standard deviation probabilities, but I explain it to my clients um, in, in the likelihood that they'll live under a bridge. I try to make it as emotional as possible. I tell them, I can ask them the question how they would feel if their portfolio lost 30%, but I explain that. I can't really simulate the pain they'd be feeling without coming across the table and kicking them in the gut at a few times. Because it, even though it happened not too long ago, our memories are very short. Can I just add one more thing to this element of risk? So from my perspective as a, as a portfolio manager, the risk to a client is not maintaining their investment plan. That's the risk. Because if they can stick with the investment plan, the probability that they're going to reach their financial goals is quite high. So the real risk is not having a plan, and then not, if you do have a plan, not maintaining the plan. And then all while if you look at standard deviation, you look at the amount of money that you might have lost in your portfolio, it all boils into this idea that you're going to do the wrong thing at the wrong time, and that's the risk that we face as uh, advisors to individuals. Hey, Robert from Longview, stand up and tell us what the leading edge analysis of risk is. <laughs> it's an theory. Stand up. something and people asked me to explain it. Uh, I thought that most people know about it, but apparently not. Uh, when I mentioned I-bonds and the ability to get uh, 10000 per person 
But then I mentioned that there was a back door to get paper out bonds of $5,000 if you overpay your tax return as a part of your tax or all of your tax refund. And the way it works is you have to intentionally overpay your taxes by $5,000. When you file your tax return, you can elect to have your entire return or part of your return uh, in I bonds, issued in I bonds, and uh, any surplus would go to your bank. Uh, you could split it any way you want. But to get the $5,000 in I bonds, you have to overpay your taxes. Some people do it by additional withdrawing. Some people do it by uh, estimated tax. But the bottom line is you overpay your tax and you can get your $5,000, up to $5,000. As opposed to the individual I bonds where it's $5,000 or $10,000 per Social Security number, with, with couples, you still can only get $5,000. I wouldn't uh, guarantee that this is going to go on. It's been in place. They honored it last year, and they <coughs> have no, there, there's nothing out that they killed it for this year. But eventually, the, their objective, obviously, is to get rid of paper out. So mm -hmm. I would expect at some point that in the future that uh, that's not going to be an option. But at least that's that's the way it works. Overpay your taxes, uh, and fill out the paperwork to get your part of your refund, part or all of your refund paper out. It's up to $5,000. So, let's get on to another question. Here's a question for Rick Perry. Rick, you wrote a blog on the three keys to investment success, philosophy, strategy, and discipline. Can you expand on these ideas? Three keys to investment success. Sounds like a book. Hmm. Which it will be. But anyway, um, okay, here's... I've been thinking a lot about the philosophy of what we do as a group and then what we do on the board. And that's where all this came from. Because we have had some severe discussions about things that don't matter much. <laughs> but we really can get into the minutia. And so in stepping back from it all, I'm saying, hey, wait a minute, we're all bogle heads. We're all sitting in this room. So at the very first level, I started thinking, we all we all in this room, and everyone who is a member of the board for the most part, and a lot of other people who are not, have the same philosophy, do we not? And we had a list of the 10 beliefs, and I didn't even know that list existed. But we all have the same philosophy. But there are perhaps 200 people in this room, and I would say that there are probably 200 different strategies for implementing that philosophy. I bonds, municipal bonds, laggard CDs, so at the strategy level, we all have different ideas of how we want to implement the philosophy. And you know what? I can't say that my idea is any better than uh, his idea, his idea, or anybody's out there idea out there. Because we won't know that until 20 years down the road who had the best strategy. So strategy can differ on the board, and most of the arguments that we have on the board are not about philosophy at all. They're about strategy and sometimes very minutia strategy, whether we should have gold or whether we should have commodities or whether we should have high yield bonds or whether we should do the Bodhi model or whatever. So the second level of this is strategy and we'll argue about that all day long. The point that I try to bring up on the board once in a while is in order not to confuse new people who are coming onto the board or uh, people who are just getting started is don't confuse strategy with philosophy. Don't confuse strategy. This is a discussion about this. We all agree on that. Now, the last part of the three keys to investment success is once you have the philosophy, once you have your strategy for whatever it is you think you need, the last part is discipline. And we do talk a lot about discipline. We were talking earlier about, you know, I said, the risk is not meeting your financial objectives. It's a discipline. So now we have discussions about how to maintain discipline. You can use some sort of a rebalancing methodology on your birthday. Uh, you can uh, you know, hire an advisor. You can use a uh, life strategy fund of some sort. I mean, that's, that maintains the discipline of the strategy, which fits the philosophy. If you don't have the discipline, if the discipline starts to break down, the strategy breaks down. 
And if the strategy starts breaking down, now you're susceptible to the next Merrill Lynch guy that calls you on the phone, which means the philosophy can also start to break down. So it goes down this way, and then you have to maintain the discipline, and it starts corroding back up the other way. And that's what my whole idea is about what we do. Was that insightful? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what you <laughs> okay, we, we have a question for Bill Schulteis from Sunny. It says, the coffee house portfolio received a lot of attention and popularity during the last decade, part of which is at least due to the outperformance of small value and other tilts over the market or S&P 500. If reversion to the mean happens, mm -hmm. then the can the coffee house portfolio and the coffee house under perform, perform? How can we keep the coffee house message popular? Wow, that's a great question, Sonny. And uh, you know, I think I would have liked to say that I planted that question because it uh, encompasses a lot of what is discussed on the board. Uh, first, I would uh, I think it's important. Uh, for me to share with anyone who wants to listen that in the book I said that the simplest best approach is uh, like a three fund portfolio total domestic total international total bond I said if you want to fine-tune an already good thing here's a way to do it and that was kind of how I, I started articulating that coffee house philosophy in my weekly column in 2000 and it just kind of took on a life of its own. You know, a Paul Farrell hooked it up on the lazy portfolios, and I have consistently said that there are, as Rick was saying, there's countless different ways to build a passive por portfolio. You can do it with actively managed funds. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a stroke of luck that from 2000 to 2010, value in small and international outperformed large cap stocks. So the question is, you know, what is the purpose of diversification in these different components of the market? Well, I loved what Joel Dixon said last night about that whole issue. And what he said is, is that basically he does not want to have, I mean, clearly over a 10 year period, these different components of the market can perform dissimilar to each other. And case in point, 2000 to 2010. Last night, Joel Dixon said, you know, he doesn't want to be in that underperforming sector over the next 10 years. And that's kind of the way that I look at it myself. If I'm going to buy a total stock market index fund, what's important is that I stay the course. And I accept the fact that from 2000 to 2010, it's going to underperform. If I have a more diversified portfolio that's tilted away from a total stock market fund and small and value and international outperform the S&P 500, which it very well may do, I think it has over the last three or four years, you know, the important thing is to stay the course and not to chase performance when these different components of the market underperform each other. Because as Rick was saying, you know, it's the philosophy that counts. And if, the, if you can't adhere to the philosophy, everything else breaks down. And so the philosophy, in my opinion, is to you know, embrace a low-cost portfolio that broadly represents where you're at in your life. And then what it does is it allows you to focus on your financial planning issues, which for 99% of the people, including me, is I need to save more than I spend. Does that answer your question, Sonny? Can you, tell, can you tell us the subtitle to your book? <laughs> How to Build Wealth, Ignore Wall Street, and Get On With Your Life. I think that's more important than the portfolio. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I have to say that in connecting with everyone here. Where's Molly? Molly, are you here? You know, here's a woman that ran her, what, her first marathon when, how old were you? 65. 65 years old. with an entity and a program that I have been involved with and who, where's Bill Davidson? Stand up, Bill. Is he here? He's not here. He's involved also. He's, she's involved with hospice. To me, the biggest, is, well, I don't want to get into that, but you know, she's, it gives her the authority to know that she's doing the right thing with her portfolio so she can pursue other things in her life. And, you know, I travel all across the nation, not to talk about strategy, but to connect with people who are really getting on with their lives. It's so inspirational. Just, you know, my hat is off to all of you for coming here.
Where's Kelvin? All the way from Taiwan. He left. <laughs> What's that? Not a long flight. Okay. So thanks, Mike, for bringing that up. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to you know, add a tag to all of that, you know, if you invest with any of the kinds of portfolios that we recommend from the coffee house portfolio through the tilt portfolios that Rick and I recommend, you've been through hell and back the past several years, and you know, you know, it's hard. You know, I suppose we couldn't see times that are even worse than that, but you probably have the discipline to stick with it. Um, we could probably fill ten rooms like this with enthusiasts of the Harry Brown portfolio, which is one quarter gold, long bonds, stocks, and bills. Uh, and, and these are people who've had nothing but pizza and beer for the past 15 years. And there are a lot of enthusiasts, Harry Brown enthusiasts out there, and they're going to get, you know, get their trial by fire in the next five or ten years, I'm pretty sure. It'll be very interesting to see what happens to that group. By the way, I like the Harry Brown portfolio. I think it's a valid way to manage assets in the long term. It's not for me, uh, and probably not for any of the people in this room. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, those are the people I really worry about. Oh, I'm not a fan either of the Harry Brown, but again, it, it falls under the local head philosophy because there's a passive strategy, and they are using low-cost index funds. I'm not a fan of it either, but uh, you know, again, it gets down to our individual preference. Okay, we have a, we had a question on uh, somebody asked me to elaborate on this. Uh, Taylor's three fund por por uh, portfolio, which I think was mentioned by several people: total stock, total bond, and total international. Uh, Taylor later revised it when tips came out to add tips. Uh, the question was, first of all. Uh, can you explain to a lay person what tips are, and would you add that to uh, the total bond uh, portfolio with total bond to be part of your bond allocation? Uh, well, tips are just uh, inflation-adjusted bonds. They promise an after-inflation return rather than a nominal or before-inflation return. And as far as whether I would add them to a portfolio, I think it depends on personal circumstances, specifically how exposed are you to inflation. Uh, retirees tend to have more inflation risk than somebody whose overall economic well-being is primarily dependent upon a job. Young people who, you know, most of their economic well-being is just their future earnings, which hopefully will keep up with inflation. And that's, um, that's different from if you have a financial portfolio and you really are facing inflation risk. And I think then that's when pitch become significantly more helpful. I, I would go ahead. Rick. I'm just going to clarify that, that tips are a hedge against unanticipated inflation because the inflation rate is already embedded into all asset classes, including treasury bonds, but not bills right now. I mean, the Fed is manipulating things a little bit in treasuries, but it, it's already embedded in stock prices, real estate, rents, all of this stuff. So, what they are are a hedge against an unanticipated jump in the inflation rate. And it has to be a jump because of inflation goes into deflation, then you're actually going to be worse with tips than you are with the nominal trade. Just to pick up on Mike's comments, I know some, sometimes people are looking for guidelines about how much to invest in tips, and I completely agree that it's very individual specific. I talked to John Amrix at Vanguard about this issue. We were talking about their target date products specifically, and those products do not include tips until one reaches roughly the age of 50, and that syncs up with the work that my colleagues at Ibbotson, which is under the Morningstar umbrella, do where they really don't add tips to the portfolio for people who are very much in accumulation mode, but do start to add them in for people approaching retirement. Ibbotson's uh, recommended allocations to tips as a percentage of the fixed income portfolio typically run in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 percent of the bond portfolio. Um, in tips, and I think John Amerix told me yesterday that the target date funds include about 20% of their overall allocations in tips. So those are just some guidelines. I think um, most of us, I don't know, what might agree that tips aren't particularly attractive at this juncture. Um, and so I would say if you're building a tips position, my, my best guidance would be to do so gradually over a period of years rather than adding a lot right now. 
I'm not wildly enthusiastic about TIPS in an accumulation phase portfolio, but where I think they're the most useful is in immunizing your future real living expenses. So a person, for example, who is 60 years old uh, might purchase what I call a full body. Uh, it's like full Monty, uh, except that uh, it's, it's tips instead of the absence of clothes. Uh, and, and, what a full, and what a full Bodhi is, is a ladder of tips in each and every year that immunizes you out to about, you know, 100. Obviously, we'll have to double up in the first 10 years because you know, there's, there's no 40 year tips. And then roll that over in 10 years and buy the 30 year tips. And that absolutely immunizes all of your real living expenses if you save 40 times. Your, your living expenses, which I suspect more than a few people in this room have done. Uh, they're not particularly attractive right now, but it's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, and maybe you won't want to build the full body, but you can build, build part of it. Uh, and it's a very useful thing. It takes the place, basically, of an annuity. I, I like tips. I own tips. And Bill, I'd be interested to see if you back me up on this. I'll, I'll confess I'm a bit of an active investor when it comes to tips. Uh, tips are the safest investment around. U.S. Treasury backed, no inflation risk. In 2008, when mark stocks tanked, people shouldn't have run to tips, but instead they were yielding well over 3.5%. It was a very good investment then. Now, it's much less good now, in my opinion, with CPIU minus, uh, what, about 0.7, 0.8%? I, I was very attracted to tips when they topped out over 4% back in the early, or the late 1990s. Uh, I'm, I'm not terribly uh, enthusiastic about them right now either. You know, but, you know, you've got a negative yield on the curve all the way out to about 20 years. It's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, but people need to understand that's a negative real yield. Negative real yield. Right. Uh, as opposed to nominal yield that you get on the regular. And people look at, uh, don't understand that their CD, which is yielding uh, 0.5, has a built-in negative real return of uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, 2% or something. So they compare and think the, uh, the CD is better when, in fact, the, the real return on a negative or tip is still better than the uh, re negative real return that they're going to what Alan is referring to is something that Larry Sweater has explicitly written about, which is buying, buying low and selling high. Have you ever heard about that? Uh, <laughs> tips, uh, and, and I will admit to have you know, fallen off the book of the wagon in that regard as well. Uh, it's a fun game to play, but that game has long been since over. Maybe it'll we'll start again. Uh, you may ask the question of tips. Say again, please. Any question on tips? Go ahead. Does Vanguard have a, sh it was announced they had a short fund for tips now? Yeah, I think. Yeah, Could you yes. address the advantages of the short fund versus the long fund? Well, one thing, and I'd like to ask Bill this, or anybody on the panel or in the audience, is that, you know, the tips have, the, the longer tips have had significant price appreciation. And so my question is, uh, if rates go up, you know, are you going to see some uh, significant price decline. Now I realize you still have the unexpected inflation built in, but I think that you know, you've still got the issue of, uh, Rick, why don't you answer that? You know, you've got some significant uh, short-term principal decline. Yeah, it, it depends on why interest rates went up. If interest rates went up uh, with, with the real rates of return go up, meaning that um, well, inflation, so inflation expectations remain low, but interest rates go up. But inflation didn't go up. But interest rates went up. That's a that's a real rate of return. That's a risk to tips. Vice versa, if inflation goes up and interest rates go up, then that's not a, a risk to tips. Yeah. The, 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 the real, but there's another risk of tips, which I think you overshadows even that, which is really didn't. Get, get revealed until the crisis, which is there's, there's a third risk, which is liquidity risk. Uh, the, 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 you know, from 07 to late 08, the long tips was, I think, the 30-32 the tips, which have 24-year maturity, and it declined by almost 25%. So that means the 30-year tips, well, you know, in a similar event, would decline by about 30%. Uh, in principal value. So it's a peculiar asset class. It is absolutely riskless in a real sense. 
uh, in real terms when held to maturity, which is how you really want to be using them. All right? uh, but you know, if, you're, if you depend on them for short-term liquidity, then good luck with that. And that's where the short-term tips comes in to answer your question. Okay, short-term tips have far less of this price volatility. So it, it's a, instead of using the Vanguard short-term bond index fund as sort of your cash position because you want to get some yield out of it while you're waiting to spend that money over the next two or three years, um, you can use short-term tips fund. It would protect you from an unanticipated jump in inflation and it's just an alternative to not quite a money market, but a short-term bond fund. Uh, the announcement had said that the expected maturity for the fund is somewhere around 2.7 years instead of um, eight and a half, which is what the current TIPS fund has. So it's got to be about one third as responsive in price to movements in real interest rates. Um, so that's the reduced risk. The, of course, drawback is that you're just earning lower returns because they're short term bonds. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is. Uh, one more from Modest, is Modest here? Modest asks, what is your view, pro and con, of stable value funds in 401k plans? What role should they play in a portfolio? Well, I, I put a post on this actually on both heads uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Was, and it had people, I wanted people to go look at, read an article by Scott Simon, uh, who was a very talented attorney out in California, who also uh, is a fiduciary attorney, and he also has a money management company out there. If you go on the mobile heads and you look at stable value mobile funds, and you look, you look that up, this post will come in. What you find is Scott looked under the hood of this, as other people have. I know Larry Swedro did a lot of work on this as well. And uh, it really depends on you know, what's under the hood. Who are you dealing with? Who is this, these insurance contracts that are being put into this stable value fund? Who issued them? So, I mean, it sure, sure sounds good, but every time something sounds good in investing, I mean, you really need to look under the hood, right? And have you done articles on stable value, Larry? Let me know. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. Alan. <laughs> um, I haven't written about them, but I agree it's what's under the hood. Um, the, the U.S. government's thrift savings plan has a G fund, which is essentially a stable value that pays almost as much as the bond, and I've tried to get somebody from the government to hire me for one day, uh -huh. pay me $1, <laughs> and, and fire me, because I would love to be in it. But there's a reason why some are paying higher rates, in that um, the company in the 401k or 403b and the insurance company signed a longer term contract when rates are higher. Uh, but I tell clients that are in the stable value fund that are you know, insurance contracts that there are default, there is default risk, and I suspect others may argue with me that um, most insurance companies would have gone under in 2008 without the uh, government bailout. On uh, stable value funds, not to put too fine a point to it, or uh, a company called Invesco, are you all familiar with that? Do they have a fairly good reputation? in terms of stable value fund management? I'm not familiar with their products. I mean, oh. except for the fact that they own power shares. Did you observe the stony stare from the audience? <laughs> I'm sorry. I said you observe the stony stare from the panel. <laughs> They're active managers, right? Uh, I, yes, I believe so. I don't know. A limited choice. Do they own AIM? Yes, they do. One yeah, I, I, you know, there's always a trust factor, and I, I don't think of Invesco and AIM as, as one of the good guys. I would say as a general statement, um, one thing I've noticed just anecdotally is that the stable value yields have come down quite a bit over the past year or two. Um, and, and I guess I get a little nervous when I see people looking at things that maybe will yield 3% versus just hunkering down if it's money that you truly need to keep safe. Is that yield pickup really worth the risk? Um, and maybe if you have an awful lot of money, it is. But I think that people really should be mindful of anything that's that's promising an appreciably higher yield or even a, a modestly higher yield than, than true cash right now. I mean, there are there is the odd free lunch out there. Uh, um, Tia Kref, for example, has uh, a 
the very the, the TA traditional fund, which is basically a money market that, that if you got into it three or four years ago, still yields you three percent. You can add more money to, and I've looked under the hood of that. It's you know pretty darn good fund. It's got fairly stock solid uh, holdings. But what you're doing in that fund, of course, is somebody who's paying for that. The person who's paying for that are the people who have on the variable annuity side of that same fund who are stuck in it for years. And so they can maintain the maturity. And if you have an IRA in it, you don't have that constraint. Uh, but it's a special situation. But if you, you know, if you, if you qualify for TIA correct, I think you can still get a percent and three quarters out of it the last I looked. Okay, we have a question from Stephen Enter. Did I pronounce your name correctly? All the way in the back. He says, what allocation and disper disbursement strategy would you recommend for a retiree has no, who has no heirs and would like to come as close as possible to depleting his assets without eventually depleting it? <laughs> uh, I think the, the answer seems clear to me that uh, that's perfect candidate for a single premium immediate annuity. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, it needs to be inflation adjusted though, because think of it, it's, it's an annuity with a duration for the rest of your life. So if we do hit hyperinflation, your spending power is going to go down and down. And if you take the inflation adjusted, that's an extra insurance premium, and that drastically lowers the amount you're going to be paid. And then there's default risk uh, as well. Yeah, if you're going to put a big portfolio, you have to realize that uh, states have limits on the guarantee that they, it's, it's, it's not guaranteed by the states, but it's a state guarantee program, and each state has different limits. Uh, I think that the majority are around 200, 300,000. Oh, 100,000. Yeah, 100,000 100, individually, yeah. but uh, 300,000 total, I think, in some states. Uh, some. But anyway, you would have to check the state that you live in to make sure that you have the proper number. and. Uh, some people uh, would suggest that you don't buy all of it from the same insurance company so that you spread your risk around of the insurance company going under. Uh, while the guarantee, uh, the way I understand the guarantees work or is similar to the FDIC with bank fails, they try to get the other, uh, other insurance company to pick up the slack and the other insurance companies apparently pay into it. But the bottom line is, is that you might not get your check for, from a company that, uh, from an insurance company that, that goes belly up or has a problem. So you want to uh, spread your risk around with the insurance company. And the okay. social security check. Well, one thing I posted about on this that I think some of the others might have also recommended is the self-unwinding tips ladder for the first 5, 10, 15 years and then a smaller lump sum annuity at age 75, 80, 85, with the last part, where you get the mortality credit, really important. Well, you wait, you delay it, you buy the uh, annuity. Uh, can, can I just go to a 10,000 foot level on this question, because it's actually an interesting question when you think about it. Uh, the question was, I don't have any heirs, so I want to spend every dime I have on my deathbed, I want to pay the mortuary and then die. No, 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 the check to the mortuary is supposed to bounce. Use oh. <laughs> a credit card. Use a credit card. Okay, it works out well. Thanks, I have Okay, but here's the, here's the point. The point is that, like, now from the 10,000 foot level, that's his situation. So, what asset allocation, what strategy should he use in his portfolio? What withdrawal strategy should he have, given the amount of money he has? given Social Security and everything else that he's got coming in to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. It's going to be very different than somebody who has four kids and wants each one of them to inherit on an inflation-adjusted basis all the assets you have today. The withdrawal rate is going to be different. So sometimes we get into the minutia about what's the four, is the 4% withdrawal rate the optimal withdrawal rate, and we argue back and forth forever on this. And the answer is, for him, it might be 6%. For somebody who's got, who's 60 years old and has four kids and they want every dime to go to their four kids, might be 3%. So each one is very specific. And uh, the inheritance question is really going to determine a lot, not only about asset allocation, but also withdrawal strategy. Yeah, I, I mean, clearly, I think the most applicable strategy here is the George Raft strategy. Yeah. You, you remember? 
George Raff was the actor who said that he, he spent ten million dollars on women, booze, and gambling, and the rest of it he wasted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think the key to the recommendation is the unique situation: no errors and what's suspended all. And not great. unusual. Oh well, no, I'm, I'm saying no, it's unique to him and it's not so I mean, it's not but, but also it's it's not so unique in that for the vast majority of people, investors, they're to maintain any semblance of a standard of living, they're gonna have to spend their assets down over time. And with the, the, the I feel the important thing is to again establish a financial plan that allows you to visually see how you can spend it down at a rate that uh, makes sense and then readjust it every year based on inflation, based on what happens in the markets, and, and also based on the biggest question mark of all in retirement is that is what is your health care cost? There's one more thing I want to throw out there which we haven't heard yet, and that is a reverse mortgage on your home. And I think that'll, for your situation, if you have a home, a reverse mortgage might be the thing you want to do. So we haven't talked about reverse mortgages as part, um, you have talked about it remember, for years past as part of this financial plan. Um, one other quick mention um, to back up to the annuity discussion, um, Mel, you mentioned the idea of buying multiple annuities to spread the insurer risk. I think there's another good reason to think about maybe laddering annuities, which is the current interest rate environment. So single premium immediate annuities are quite low by historical standards right now due to the current interest rate environment. So even though it would be more cumbersome than buying just a single immediate annuity and letting it ride, I think it does make sense to, to spread out the purchases over a period of time to potentially obtain a range of interest rate environments. On the topic of buying annuities, if you're looking to stay within the state guarantee association limits, it's important to note not only that the limit varies by state, but the applicable rules vary by state. So for instance, some states will back you up, they'll make you whole in the event that the annuity defaults. If you live in that state, when it defaults, other states, their guarantee applies if you purchased the annuity when you lived in that state. So for instance, if you currently live in a state that has a $300,000 limit and you're considering moving to another state in retirement, this is something you'll want to think about because you don't want to move to a state with a $100,000 limit. That's, I mean, there are obviously other factors involved in moving place of living. But uh, you would want to pay attention to those rules and see if it's going to expose you to an additional level of credit risk. Bill, didn't you write that it, there's a systemic issue in the insurance industry, the state guarantee would be a little more than a speed bump? Uh, that, that was the word I used, yes. <laughs> and then I, I have a pet peeve, and everyone does this, including last night. You know, you can earn 7% income on an annuity. Why would you therefore want to buy a 1.7% total bond fund? I've compared apples to oranges. Uh, most of the return on the single premium immediate annuity is your return of principal. <laughs> well, it's even, it's even better than principal. It's the principal of the people who die before you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a non mobile question from Motorheads. Gold coins or gold ETF? Oh, gold coins, absolutely. <laughs> gold coins. I mean, look, uh, if, if, they, if Armageddon comes, is anybody going to want to buy your share of the GLB? <laughs> it's if you can trade it. If the markets are even open, no, you're going to have those gold coins sitting in your safe next to your shotgun. <laughs> What, 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 uh, I'll play the straight man here. And more seriously, uh, Craig Rowland who wrote a wonderful book on the permanent portfolio. He's got about 70 pages. It's just fascinating to read about why are you buying gold? Okay, are you buying it to hedge inflation? Well, then buy GLD, buy a gold miner. I would even say buy a, a just a natural resources fund like the energy fund. All right, uh, which is in spite of Jack's comments, I think it's an excellent fund. Uh, you know, I think they find thing by, by bringing that fund out. Uh, you know, if on the other hand you're you're worried about uh, breakdown of social water, then you know probably can go to ammo or a better bet. Uh, and if you're really concerned uh, about the entire breakdown of society, uh, then then you want to put gold in a vault in New Zealand or Switzerland. 
Why don't you talk? He tells you exactly how to do all this. It's absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, seriously. Uh, and and then, then your only problem, of course, is getting out and finding a way out of the country. Okay, there's, there's a, a comment and a question. It's, it says, it seems every financial expert is saying to get out of bond funds this year. Some say to buy individual bonds instead. Thoughts? Uh, I'll just take a stab at that. I'm, okay, well, what do bond funds hold? Exactly. Individual bonds. All right, so what, what's the purpose of getting out of bond funds to go into individual bonds? I can see doing a bond ladder if you have liabilities that have stepped out over 10 years. So you're going to build a 10-year ladder of tips, no problem. You're going to, you've got liabilities going out over five years. You want to buy a five-year CD ladder, hit those liabilities. Let's say college savings. You have children going to college. You want to buy, I used to buy zero coupon bonds for my children. So you know, I, I knew exactly what I had coming due every year for them to go to college. Okay, that's a good reason to buy a bond. You're retired and you're going to be retired for 20 years, 25 years. The liability, of, I mean, the duration of your, your liabilities are, about, if you add it all up, you do it mathematically, it probably comes up to about five or six years. The duration of your liability. The duration of an intermediate term bond fund is about five years. Now, the next year, a year from now, the duration of your liabilities doesn't come to four years, it stays at five years. So what I'm saying is with an intermediate term, a bond fund, municipal fund, total bond market. The liability, uh, the duration of your liabilities and the duration of your bond assets are about the same. If, if you buy individual bonds, it, it complicates that. And so I'm not a, I'm not a fan of doing it. Well, let, let me, let me take a poll then. Bill, do you think that uh, people should get out of bond funds? No. Rick? No. No. Mike? Not while it depends. Mike? Uh, no, but Alan probably has something to say about savings. <laughs> you said what I was going to say. And, uh, well, I think it's very important that uh, people have an understanding of uh, the, what can happen to bond funds in a rising interest rate environment and to basically stay the course. Speak, uh, Vanguard has an excellent piece on, on the importance of staying the course if you have an intermediate bond fund when the price begins to drop. It's just, it's wonderful. We show it to every client who has an intermediate term bond fund because we're drilling in them the importance of not getting out of it when the, you know, your, the net asset value starts to drop, and, but to stay there to capture the higher returns down the road. So you're prepared for it when interest rates do go up. I, you know, it's just going to be... Uh, the outflow of bond funds, dollars out of bond funds, when interest rates go up, they're just going to be off the charts. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are any number of phrases that you hear from time to time that they all fall into the same category, which is the old 60-40 portfolio doesn't work anymore, indexing doesn't work anymore, uh, the traditional portfolio doesn't work anymore, and, you know, don't buy a bond fund anymore, buy bonds. They all say exactly the same thing, which is hold on to your I would just like to add one thing to Bill's comment. His 60-40 portfolio doesn't work. A week and a half ago, there was a great article in the New York Times about endowment funds face hard landing. And a guy, you know, somebody did research on all these endowment funds, and the conclusion that he came to is that a 60-40 low-cost index fund portfolio is darn hard to beat. And I posted it on my website, or you can email me. It's a great article. You know, I, I better, better, actually. Is that yeah. <laughs> what? I, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal Total Return blog about a month and a half ago. I quoted Bill Bernstein in it. But I walked through the simple math of owning a bond versus a bond fund and addressed the myth that if you own a bond and hold it to maturity, um, it's just an illusion that you eliminated interest rate risk. That's All right, well, uh, there was a method to my madness. Uh, There's also, by the way, a cash drag on, on buying individual bonds because if you will buy an individual bond ladder, it's got interest rate com interest coming in. What do you do with it? If you're not spending it, it sits there in the money market earning zero percent interest until you have enough money or until the bond comes due, where you can go out and buy another bond. It actually drags down the, the yield of the portfolio. That was brilliant and insightful. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a method coming from you that means something else. <laughs> there was a method in my madness in holding the panel. Because the question says, it seems every financial expert is saying to get out of bond funds. 
we have a panel of experts here who say don't. So every financial expert is not saying get out of line funds. That's the answer that I hope you take right out of that. Uh, we have one final question here, and I think it's the answer should be fairly obvious, but do you think it's reasonable to assume that no one can accurately predict how any asset class will perform for any length of time in the future? Yes. No. Uh, and the reason why I disagree with that is obviously the question that, 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 that you know, the way that people use to try to answer that is in the short term. But in the long term, I think you can look at valuations and make a probabilistic statement. When stocks or yield are, are selling for 35 times earnings, I think their future returns are going to be lower than when they're selling at 10 times earnings. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't tell you what to do tomorrow. Well, uh, let, me, let me make sure you got that whole thing. It says for any length of time. Yeah. You're, you're picking out a particular time. Yeah, yeah, for any length, yeah. In other words, I would say for any period that's less than 15 or 20 years, you can't do it. Right, okay. So, mm -hmm. that, was a, that was the reason I said that, because I said Okay, what is the question again? Did you read it? <laughs> is it reasonable to assume that no one can accurately predict how any asset class will perform for any asset class? Is it reasonable to predict that no one can? No. Then is it reasonable to assume? Assume. No assume. assume no one can predict. Basically, the any asset class will perform. Oh, any asset any class. length of time. For any length of time would be one day into infinity. I don't know. I <laughs> think <laughs> that. I think maybe a better way to rephrase that question is maybe you can't predict it, but what assumptions do you use in your financial planning process? And for the, and, and for that, I think going back to what Bill Bernstein said and uh, uh, Vanguard alluded to last night was, you know, the best predictor of interest rates or, or fixed income is what they're yielding now, I think. And on the equity side, what you know Bill was saying was that and I think Jai, everyone's saying, you know, maybe use six to eight percent based on current valuations, dividend being a little bit yet less, and use that as, as a, a starting point in your financial planning process, realizing that you may be off. But you don't find out that you're off 20 years from now and start making adjustments. You make adjustments along the way based on those assumptions. Can I answer the question now that I have a clarification? <laughs> so, go for it. I, I, I make predictions out 30 years, um, and I actually sort of made predictions out 10 years. But they're, they're my expectations of returns. I don't think that they should be used for, well, 30, 30 year out, the expected returns of asset classes are based on the inherent risks of the asset class, of the asset class relative to each other. So your very safe asset classes like short term tips are going to give you a very low return because they're the safest in every aspect. But as you go out further and further, you start taking more and more risk. The riskiness of the asset class, the volatility, if you will, part of that uh, should, it, you know, you, you wouldn't invest in equities if they weren't riskier. And uh, I mean, you wouldn't invest in equities if you weren't expecting a higher rate of return because they're risky. So you can make predictions in, in the very long run that stocks should outperform bonds, <laughs> that uh, bonds should outperform cash. I mean, these are the types of you know, predictions you can make. I don't know. How accurately you can make them, but I think you can make them. How about oh. a 30 year zero coupon treasury? Say again. Well, you know exactly what it is. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Not a real term. Not a real coupon treasury bond. RSC. Yeah. 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 Well, at, th at this time, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I have a few announcements to make and some recognitions. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the video will be available. Rich is making, it will be available online in the segments, is that correct, Rich? Correct. Right. And uh, uh, either Rich or I will make a post on the forum when they are available to alert you to that. Uh, after it's all done, uh, are we going to do a DVD this year or are we just going to go online? Everything will be online this year, so you won't even have to order the DVD. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize the people who really make this event uh, uh, work. I've got an all-star team, and believe me,
couldn't pull it off without them. There's a million and one details that go on in putting this event on, and we actually worked for over a year to, to do it. We're already starting to plan on next year's event. So I would like to call up my all-star staff, uh, Ed Rager, Patty Rager, Paul and Linda Davis. Would all the volunteers please stand up and be recognized? 